Great. Well, thank you very much. Well, it's always a pleasure to come here and talk to folks, and, and I know many of you, and, and for those of you who don't know me, maybe they'll get a little more insight, and thanks, Scott, for that introduction. Um, makes me feel like I've done something when someone else says it. <laughs> but um, so, let's see, get this going here. So I wanted to talk about what probably a lot of, well, I mean, the public knows about MPAs, but typically when they think about marine protected areas, they're thinking about the state implemented marine protected areas. Um, here in California, but the sanctuaries are federal marine protected areas. So I just want to highlight that, in fact, um, the national system has a series of uh, sanctuaries that are all denoted by these circles. These are areas that are protected because of their unique value. Um, in some cases, they're very large, like in the case of Monterey, where we cover over 6,000 square miles, which is completely dwarfed by the National Marine Monument in Papahanaumokuakea, which um, was expanded to over 150,000 square miles um, and for about a month was the largest marine protected area on the planet. And then you guys know what dwarfed that? And the, the Antarctic. So they, they, they had this, uh, so anyways, it's like the sanctuary was all ready to roll out with these bragging rights. And then it's like, nope, sorry. <laughs> you got usurped in just a month or so. But, um, so there are all these different um, uh, federal marine protected areas, and I'm going to talk a lot about my job and sort of the intersection between science and policy today. So it's probably going to be a little different um, from many of the other talks you have during the course of the semester, but hopefully um, this gives you a little bit insight into what a government job entails to a certain extent. My job is a little bit unique in that I do a lot of different things that are not necessarily what most government people working for NOAA do. Um, but in this area, uh, anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about some of those examples. So like I said, there's different kinds of MPAs, and I just want to focus in on California. So both of these maps indicate uh, marine protected areas. On the case of the federal waters, we have the Greater Fairlawns, which just last year expanded up into uh, almost towards Point Arena and um, captured a lot of the coastline. One of the things, in some, it was really surprising to see in the Sentinel uh, that one of the local newspapers, I live up in Santa Cruz, uh, an article about how they're, they're, the Governor Brown has written a letter to the, um, President Obama to try and um, prevent offshore drilling off the coast of California. And, and uh, one of the reasons sanctuaries are used in these areas, and actually the reason why the Monterey Sanctuary really came into play uh, in 1992 when it was designated was to prevent offshore oil drilling. That's one of the restrictions that we have in sanctuary designation. And so um, these areas here where Greater Fairlawns has captured some new areas that also prevents drilling. But anywhere you go out into the EEZ, now granted it's really deep water and the technology can't access any oil if it is out there. But the idea is that at least along the near shore shelf, beyond state waters, federal waters are protected from um, Point Arena now all the way down to Cambria between these uh, three contiguous uh, sanctuaries. So we're not going to have a coastline that looks like, say, Santa Barbara or Ventura, where you have oil rigs offshore. And that was something that, surprisingly, in 92, uh, Bush Sr. was the one who signed in uh, to having the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary established through the National Marine Sanctuaries Act. So, um, but nestled within these large uh, federal uh, areas are a whole series of state MPAs, probably many of which you're much more familiar with. Many of you may even actually work in several of these marine protected areas that were designated by the state starting in 2007, some of which were pre-existing marine protected areas and just sort of got folded into the new state nomenclature. So what I want to talk about today is kind of, there's always, there should always be a question driving the science related to management of a marine protected area. And so I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about how resource agencies typically do this. And, and the simplest question is, is what is out there? Um, in many cases, we know to a certain extent. But for a place as large as Monterey Bay uh, National Marine Sanctuary, there's lots of stuff we don't know. Every time a cruise goes out to Davidson Seamount and they drop an ROV down and on top of that extinct volcano, they find not just species that they haven't seen in California before, but species that are actually new to science. So there's still a lot that we don't know. But even if you think about the intertidal 
if you think about the nearshore uh, subtitle, um, or even in the case of Elkhorn Slough, part of which the sanctuary actually extends into the main channel of Elkhorn Slough. Many of you may or may not know that. But um, our managers, the people I work for, are often asking what's out there. And those people are usually not um, biologists, and they have very little experience with what's actually in the sanctuary. I'm very fortunate in that my job position allows me to see a lot of this stuff firsthand. Another question that an agency, particularly one that's a resource agency that's managing marine resources, asks is, how are things going out? How are things doing out there? So what's out there and how well is it doing? Um, that's a very complicated question, and we have lots of different groups trying to answer that question in a variety of ways. And then finally, we want to know why it is the way it is, whether it's good or bad, improving or declining. Understanding what's driving that process is going to help you manage it to achieve whatever the end point is that you want to achieve. So that's to, those are kind of the, the general questions that managers ask. It's very hard to translate those into very easy, succinct scientific questions that can be answered um, in, a, in a quick way. So, what, so I, Mark was here last week, right? He gave you guys a talk about Pisco, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it. But we often at the sanctuary are relying on folks like you, academic researchers, to help provide us with information about our areas. And the first one is, when we're asking what is out there, oftentimes this is basically characterization. And it's actually in the Sanctuary's Act that we are supposed to characterize our resources. It's not a very exciting thing, typically, for people who are pursuing academic, um, uh, uh, an academic job, because you're not going to get tenure saying, well, I just go out and I describe a lot of stuff. You don't usually get a lot of publications that way. You don't usually get a lot of recognition from the university to support that. But for us as an agency, understanding what's out there is actually a key component of our overall science program. Uh, also, we want, if you want to know how something is doing, that requires repeated measurements of something, ideally over a broad space and multiple years of time, so that you can look at how it is changing over time. And we have different um, uh, sort of requirements to both know what the current status of something is and how it has or has not been changing over time. So that's an important to have monitoring program. And, and that's also another academically, typically unappealing pursuit, because you might say, oh, I'm going to start a program, but we're really not going to have results for 15 years. You don't get tenure pr proposing that to somebody. They want information quickly, and you're only going to get funding from NSF for three or four years at a time. And then the thing that's probably more near and dear to many of your hearts is actually looking at sort of these mechanistic aspects and doing experiments to tease apart what are the underlying factors that are driving some of these changes or why is the status a certain way. And that's also very obviously a way that we plug into the scientific community and using particularly in this case grad student research in many cases because you're looking at something on the order of two, three, four years and you're going to get a, a discrete answer to something that could help us both in terms of modifying monitoring programs or seeking other ways of under, better understanding the system, building upon your own work. So we've got three kinds of science I'm going to talk about. And this is sort of how I break down um, today's talk. And they relate to those um, different aspects. And the first is I'm going to talk a little bit about biodiversity surveys that we've done largely in-house, but also relying on uh, researchers to go out diving with us. And that's going to be talking about a lot of work we'd, we've done in the past off of the, the research vessel Fulmar, um, which is the West Coast Regional 67-foot boat down in Monterey that we use um, to do work off of the coast here. Um, then we have annual surveys. And this is going to be a little bit of a repeat of what uh, Mark is doing, uh, Mark Carr was doing at UC Santa Cruz. I'm heavily involved with the PSCO program and do a lot of the training associated with the people who are collecting those monitoring data in those areas. And then, more recently, some behavioral studies um, by this student. This is uh, Olivia Rhodes, who many of you may know or recently saw her talk at WSN. She's a graduate student of Jay Stackwitz, is up at Bodega Marine Lab. And she came down to uh, Monterey in, in 2014 and 15 to do field work related to fish behavior inside and outside of marine protected areas. 
So I'm going to walk through a little bit of each one of these um, and, and talk about some of the uh, linkages between management and um, the data themselves. So the biodiversity surveys, the reason this was originally sort of implemented was we had and we continue to have landslides along the Big Sur coastline. The landslides have the potential to close off Highway 1 and Caltrans, the Department of uh, Transportation for California, has to reopen those uh, areas. Now, oftentimes, the landslide can generate um, certain material that they have to move, um, and that's where we get involved because they require a permit, not just from us, but from the California Coastal Commission and other state and federal agencies in order to start manipulating the material that Mother Nature brought down and changing what Mother Nature would do if we just left it alone. They need to start doing some engineering, and that's where the, we get involved in the permit process. So one of the questions we're always curious about is what are the slide impacts? First of all, in some cases, we wish we knew what was underneath it so that we could understand the impact to our resources. We can't go back to, the, to a slide and start digging it out and seeing what was killed underneath it. And in many cases, we have essentially very little information about that particular location along the coastline. We may know what the geology is like. We may have photographs and have a general idea of what the biology is like. But if someone were to say, hey, is there a black abalone, an endangered species right in that area, and did it get buried by dirt? Unless you'd had someone you know, actually doing a survey on that site beforehand, we can't say with any certainty yes or no. But we would like to know that because particularly for endangered species, if we lose them, we want to make sure we're not going to exacerbate the problem. And that also helps us with our management of them. There's not only the slide itself, but there's also the material adjacent to it and what's the sort of zone of influence relative to the actual footprint of the slide, what other areas are being impacted. And that's an area that we're actually gaining information all the time. And for the most part, not a lot of people know, along the Big Sur coastline at least, what those impacts are. And then the question ultimately boils down to a management decision. When you're giving a permit for whether it's an emergency coastal development permit through the Coastal Commission or it's the long-term solution, are you going to allow that footprint to expand or are you going to work as hard as you can to avoid it? And there's real considerations in that. Some people say, Steve, just have them truck the dirt away. And you go, well, that might be 1,000 trucks on Highway 1 spewing out a lot of exhaust to move it from Big Sur up to a landfill somewhere in the Salinas Valley, maybe. Is that really what we want to do in the net effect relative to the, the big picture? Or is it something like, well, you can add maybe 50 you know, cubic yards or 50,000 cubic yards to an area. What impact is it going to have on the adjacent sites? And so we, as an agency, oftentimes have to fight the other agencies who may or may not have the same opinion about whether that's a good or a bad thing. And so the science is helping to inform us of how to make those decisions best. And so this program, the Big Sur Near Shore Characterization, the BNC, BSNC, is what I'm going to talk about that was an initial response to this issue of what's out there. Because I'll give you a real quick anecdote. Before I started working at the sanctuary, there were slides. People from our office would literally drive to the site stand on the cliff above the landslide, and with binoculars, look at the inner tidal to see if there were abalone or limpets or things. And that's what they were basing decisions on. Somebody on a cliff with binoculars, because that was the best available science in some cases. That's the kind of level we're talking about. So, OK, so BSNC survey methods, just to give you a real quick idea, um, <clears throat> what happens is we said, let's take from Carmel River all the way down to San Corporal Creek, which is kind of near uh, Ragged Point. So kind of from Lobos to Ragged Point, that 70-mile stretch of coastline or of highway, and look at all the areas where there are kelp beds, where there are not kelp beds, where there are areas that might be prone to slides, et cetera. And we're going to pick a whole bunch of points. So these are points that were picked beforehand. And the idea, idea was, we'll then take the boat, which is this green cross, Go find, well, this is you know, some sort of general kelp bed. You know, might be there, might not be there on any particular year. And then we go out there and I say, this looks like a good spot. Let's swim across the kelp bed. 
and collect information and get as shallow as possible. And a lot of people think that sounds really awesome. And it is awesome when you're swimming through a kelp bed, but a lot of the sites are not in kelp beds, but we're still going to them because uh, much of our information prior to having some of the, the Kavitech maps being done here and some of the aerial imagery of kelp canopy was literally, it's just blue. We don't know what's there. Dive boats don't, do go down there. People don't really work there very often, so we're not sure what's going on. But that's basically the gist of it. We, we do these swims. Everyone gets geared up. We're off some stretch of the coastline of Big Sur. Everyone gets set up, and then we're going to jump off the boat, and then we're going to swim a lot. And we're usually at a depth um, that's, you know, start on kind of the outer edge of a kelp bed area, about, you know, 20 meters or so. And then when we're done, we're like, hey, you know, there's the boat really far away. And we've been, and they just keep going, God, Lonhart keeps just making us swim and swim and swim. And we get into a point where I, where I feel I'm in danger. And then, which is usually the other people behind me, like, going, man, we were ready to bail out like 10 minutes ago. Um, but we get into the near shore, and all along the way, we're collecting information. And it's giving us this sort of human ROV view of that area. And so, Here's some examples of the kinds of information we get. This is just, this is just for the invertebrates. So this is one of my, my cheat sheets that I use to collect information on about, that's like 150 or so, and then write in a bunch of others. And we have a person who's doing um, the algae and the fishes. I'm always doing the invertebrates. We have um, people who are collecting habitat notes, and we usually have a videographer with us as well who's collecting um, footage of where we're swimming which is um, from deep to shallow. And it's usually, sometimes it's been, we swim up to a kilometer, um, which is really uh, a long ways. I hate swimming. I, I love scuba diving, but I hate swimming. And so, if, like, if we can get some scooters, life will be really good. Um, and like I said, we start from, from about 20 meters to at, almost as shallow as we get. One time I actually swam onto shore, I, I was so focused I, I, my, my, I started going, God, what's wrong with my head? And it was, there was no water left on my head. And I, and I kind of stood up on my knees, and there was this guy. This was at Partington Canyon. So p the public actually have access. And this guy is looking at, like, you know, the swamp creature emerging from the beach. He did not know what was. There was just sort of just thrashing and bubbling. And he's like, whoa. And I'm like, whoa. And my buddy's behind me kind of like going in five feet of water. Like, I couldn't get you. I couldn't grab your attention. You just kept going, you know. So... Uh, that's only on really calm days, right? <laughs> a lot of times we don't get that opportunity to go that deep. We also collect information in different depth strata because a lot of what we're interested in is actually really most important closest to shore where the impacts of a slide would be most pronounced. And dives can be, they're always an hour or more with a lot of swimming. So um, this is some, just to give you a sense of some of the kind of information, this is just for the invertebrates and looking just at species richness, we have sort of relative uh, um, information on their quantities. But this is showing you where, everywhere you see uh, one of these little, little uh, rings, yellow rings, that's the location we've been diving to. And this is over the course of now 14 years we've been accumulating. We have all, not quite 100 dives made along the Big Sur coastline. And you can look at all these locations and see what the diversity is, which for the most part, we always get about 40 to 50 species, but rarely over 100. And these are obvious. This is non-destructive sampling. These are sort of macro species, so it's not everything that's there. Clearly, there's literally hundreds, if not thousands, of species there. But these are the things that people um, would recognize, many of which are species that are actually monitored by quantitative sampling regimes. So this is kind of continuing from south of Point Sur down to Lopez, and then the last area is from Lucia uh, down to Ragged Point. And I wanted to point out one area where uh, we had a big slide in 2011, um, and so these are data from repeating in the same area, very consistent results, and then at the slide itself, and then an area south of the slide. And one of the things that happened when we, were, um, when we first met with Caltrans um, related to the slide, they said, oh, there's nothing out there. Let's just push all the material in. We'll be able to open the highway faster. It's going to be easy. We'll be able to support the road, et cetera. And we're like, well, hold on a sec, hold on a sec. Let's look at, we've been to some of these places very close to that, and we found that, yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there. And um, this is just to give you a shot of, in June 2009, 
All this right here is kelp bed, right? This is what we call the north kelp bed um, at Alder Creek. The slide hasn't happened, but it's going to occur here, right off of this rock. And we had some study sites, and, and notice that, that as you move south along the coast from this point here on the way down to uh, the, the creek, uh, uh, Vicente, uh, Via Creek, that there's this definite murkiness in the water. So there's already a pre-existing sediment plume at that site. And when we went and did some of the dives in this area prior to the slide happening, we already had seen that, and the aerial images give you a real obvious view of it. This is the same shot now in, in May 2011. This is one month after the slide. You can see this is the slide here, and they're actually already bulldozing it down. They're not quite to uncovering the road in a month. It took them two months, or actually three months, to reopen the highway because there was so much material there. And <clears throat> the kelp bed is diminished here. It's a little bit harder to see this outline. It's kind of a little bit more sparse. And then you can see here's this plume of sediment right here in this kind of general light area. And then when we look at a year ago, you can see the area that used to have this really thick kelp bed. Now, granted, it's a little bit earlier in the year, but it's very sparse, and there's clearly a lot of sediment here. Not that we had a lot of rain in April of last year, but um, there's clearly, the, and then you can see this, this plume of sediment coming off. That's the slide right there. And what had been a big buffer has eroded away. And Caltrans is like, well, the road's now going to be undercut. And it had been eroding prior to the slide happening. They actually looked at the, the material of the slide helping to buffer the road from wave impact. So <clears throat> anyways, I'm going to, qualitatively, we had some indication that things were good up here prior to the slide, less so here, and even worse to the south. That's just doing the biodiversity surveys. I'll show you later some of the quantitative data from a three-year study that was funded by Caltrans to actually specifically look at this using um, some of uh, the PSCO methods. So that's actually our little break. That ends the biodiversity section of the talk. And, and now we're going to go into the sort of quantitative <clears throat> uh, monitoring side of things. So you've seen some of these slides, so I'm going to go over them relatively quickly. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this idea of there's coastline, there's kelp, and then PSCO goes out and does sampling in different depth zones in kelp beds, basically from the outer edge of kelp bed into the inner edge of a kelp bed. And when you look at this uh, little cartoon, uh, here's onshore shallow depths from five meters to the deepest depths, 20 meters. These are benthic surveys. These are the kinds of surveys that I've been doing a lot. I actually, just out of curiosity, wanted to see how many, what was the percentage of data that Pisco has for this section of coastline, of, of the Central Coast program, not Santa Barbara. And I'm almost 10% of, of UPC data, which is kind of funny because I'm like, I've been doing this a long time, doing UPC data, and now I understand why I, I really prefer collecting uniform point contact information versus swath data. But basically, this program collects information on invertebrates, targeted species of invertebrates, algae and fishes, at the same locations every year and is looking at how those resources are or are not changing, and in many cases, collecting ancillary information, like near, some near shore oceanographic information, trying to understand how recruitment and, and physical processes are or are not shaping some of those patterns. There's also the fish surveys, which sometimes I have to do those as well, much to my chagrin, where you're going out and you're collecting information on the fishes, and typically, you've got divers who are running along transects. So this is very different from those biodiversity surveys where we're basically taking a depth. I mean, we drop to a certain depth, and then we have a compass heading, and we go until we essentially run into shore and are collecting information in, in depth bins along the way. This, of all things that we see, so there's no fish that are left off the list. There's no algae. Um, we oftentimes are collecting samples and sending them to experts for identification. In this case, you're trained to count a set of species that were selected because they're likely good indicators of ecosystem, of, of community structure or, or function. And those are the only things you really care about. You're not really counting everything under the sun. And so you, there's both density data as well as percent cover data for the things that are not unitary, all the modular organisms, sponges, tunicates, et cetera. So one of the things we generated from this was we worked with PSCO to create a booklet that makes these kinds of cartoons. And these cartoons are actually 
graphical sort of artistic representation of the number of erect branching red algae and, and erect core lines actually represents the percent cover associated with them. It was a way for the public to visually look at something rather than saying, oh, we're going to show you a lot of different percentages of species that you don't know what they are. And this, on the other hand, as a cartoon, was a quick way for people to go, oh, this place has a lot of these red and purple things. It's got a lot of this stuff that looks like giant kelp and some understory stuff. I get it. And right next to it, that would be for, the, for in this case, the Big Creek State, um, for the Marine Reserve, versus the reference area. And you could look at the two cartoons and go, yeah, those look about to be about the same, rather than us trying to get people to believe a bunch of descriptive statistics. Similarly, with the habitat type, these are bins showing what the relief is, whether it's boulders, cobble, and sand. And again, you could look at the cartoon and just compare the protected area versus the reference site. And then you can actually show them a lot of the data. So here, for example, it is, this is a simplified version of the number per transect of different um, species of fishes that are counted. Um, the same list is in both panels, number per transect in the reserve versus in the reference area. And then you could talk about the invertebrates. And here we've used species that people are likely to know because they eat them or they know that other animals like to eat them, like urchins and otters and stuff like that. So you know, here we've got a very simplistic representation of how we can look at information in these protected areas where we've added a management strategy and the reference areas that lack that management strategy. The idea being, of course, that if you look at what's happening over time at those areas that are either inside or outside of the MPA, the idea is that if the management strategy is actually improving conditions, you're going to see a difference. Similarly, they could be staying the same and they're being degraded outside. Either way, you're getting a difference between the two areas. And what you're looking for then is this slope. If there's no difference, you're not going to get a, uh, the difference value is going to be level versus going up or maybe even going down. But this is, you want to, in, in theory, as a management agency, you want to see this sort of improvement that you've implemented some strategy and things are actually getting better in them in terms of density or biomass, et cetera, or even could be even uh, be diversity. So that's the idea behind that quantitative information. Now, not only can you use this sort of trend data to look at how things are improving or getting, you know, or getting worse or staying the same in MPAs, but just the data themselves on a species by species basis are important for other reasons. So Pisco, Marine, any of the long-term monitoring programs, whether intertidal or subtitle, didn't start out saying, we know there's going to be a disease event in the future, and this is going to be the way for us to quantify how much of an impact that disease has had. Okay? The data were being collected for other reasons. However, they can be informative, and they can paint a picture. So here we've got the Pycnopodia starting back in 1999, going through last year. And you see there's just a lot of bouncing around. Each one of these lines represents a different site, some of which are in MPA, some of which are not. And you're looking at the number per meter square, relatively low numbers. And then there's actually this kind of spike in a couple of them uh, prior to this crash in 2014, which many of you know we've had the sea star wasting syndrome <clears throat> event, and we've had a huge decline in a lot of our um, sea stars along the entire eastern Pacific from Alaska going into Mexico. You can also see for urchins where you've got not much happening in terms of urchins at any of these sites until about 13, 14, you start seeing the urchins. Now, they recruited, whoops, sorry, they recruited back in here somewhere, okay? A lot of people have this misperception about the loss of the stars created the explosion of urchins. The urchins were already of a certain size. They were already there. Now, whether or not their behavior changes and they move out of crevices in the absence of some of the predators that could feed on them, that's possible. It's also possible as you grow, you need more food. You don't fit in the same crevices. Urchins don't just suddenly appear at this size, the size of a golf ball or a tennis ball. It takes a few years to get there. So um, these are not what I've just shown you, the, the lack of Pycnopodia does not create an abundance of, of red urchins, um, but certainly 
uh, Pycnopodia is a predator on these urchins. So the other one that's really gone through the roof is, and looking at these are the number per meter squared, we used to have virtually no urchins at a, at a multitude of sites, essentially very few of them on a transect, to now we've actually changed the protocols of how data are collected and have a person whose primary job is counting urchin data. So this is an example of a monitoring program that had to adjust on the fly, okay? It had to make an adjustment because something was happening and the current method or the methods that had been used were not capturing that information. So that's what you try and do with, with good management is you adaptively, you adaptively manage and here it's been adaptation and methods to collect that information. So where the hell are these guys? You know, everyone goes, when are the otters going to start eating the urchins? And if Mike Foster were here, he'd probably go, see, it doesn't happen everywhere. You know, damn, you know, what's happened with Payne up in, 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 the, in Washington isn't necessary, or with Jim up in Alaska is not necessarily happening here. And, but my guess is at some point those urchins will become large enough that a few of the otters are going to make that switch. And there's actually a, a project right now that's looking at that, um, that Tim Tinker from USGS and Mark Carr are working on um, to sort of examine um, that, that issue. Now, all of that and kinds of information actually is used in an actual document that we have to produce every five to ten years, which is the Sanctuary's Condition Report. It's kind of this report card on how things are doing. And we are required to do it. And that, the information I've been showing you is the kind of thing that is in that little phone book of information. And so sometimes it's monitoring information. Sometimes it is research information. And we've even had grad students, we've used some of their information in this because it's the only available and therefore is the best available science to inform um, folks on how things, are go how things are doing in the sanctuary. Now, having said that, a monitoring program such as PSCO does not do everything right. Okay, no scientific program, if you have a very focused question, you can't use the data for all kinds of other questions. Sometimes you can, it's serendipity. But usually the data you collect should be done in a way where you've got the number of appropriate samples, you've got the number of the correct spatial design to answer a very specific question. In this case, I'm going to point out uh, one that's near and dear to my heart. As, as Scott told you, I spent a lot of my time looking at Kellett's whelk for my dissertation. And here's some information. So these are the number of whelks observed and basically all of the transects at a, at a site. In this case, it was the Hopkins Marine Station. And so here are the zeros. I'm not sure if Coletti was actually on the list at that time. I didn't ask Mark that. Um, but they're either zeros or they weren't counted. But looking at 2003 on through 2014, you're seeing, you know, not many whelks show up on Pisco transects, okay? Yet this is one of their targeted species. If you contrast this instead with what I was doing at the same exact site, and these are corrected for the amount of area that was sampled, transects versus I had um, permanent plots that were 10 by 30 meter and, and multiples of them. Here, this is corrected for that. These are the number of individuals that I would be collecting and measuring um, at the same site. And now I'll adjust the values. I'll change the axis here. So those are the PSCO data. These are the data for targeted searches for a particular organism. My point here is, while monitoring data are extremely useful and they have their role to play, you have to be careful in terms of how you use those same data about particular species for questions that maybe the design did not actually take into account and was not um, targeting to answer that particular question. And one last shot I'll show you of this is, so um, down at Cal Poly, um, Crow White and other folks are doing uh, ongoing work with looking at Caledia up and down the coast from um, Southern California up to here, which is its current northern range limit. And here they've got uh, almost 600 individuals in 2016. And I wanted to highlight this box here. The, <clears throat> this is really interesting. Both, actually, everything under 40 millimeters is something that's shown up in the last two or three years. So these are probably recruits coming from the warm blob event and the El Nino. Um, 
But all of these guys that are less than 30 millimeters are actually not counted because there's a logistical constraint when you pick species. You have to set up, well, do we look for all of them? In the cases of, of Pisco, there's a two and a half centimeter minimum size. So it has to be at least two and a half centimeters or greater, or they don't even count it. Because otherwise, you'd spend a lot of time looking for very small things, and you blow up your bottom time, and you wouldn't be able to cover as much area and get as much work done. So in the case of looking at recruits, this is completely missed by the Pisco data set. It requires someone looking for them on their own in, in, for different reasons. OK, now I told you about Alder Creek in that slide, and I'm going to just come back to it really quickly and talk about the Pisco survey. So Caltrans said, you know, we want to know what's the big deal about a landslide and adding some more material to it. Does it really affect the areas that aren't directly buried? And it's like, hey, fair question. You guys would love to have information that says, Outside of the footprint itself, we don't really do it. The dirt doesn't do anything, okay? The sediment doesn't do anything. So here again is where the, the slide was going to occur. This shows you the north at the slide itself and the south zones. And so the same kind of pr protocols were used not for fish, but just for the algae and for the invertebrates. And they also did a bunch of work. Um, uh, Pete Ramondi's group did a bunch of intertidal work as well as part of this three-year study. And I'm just going to show you a couple of things that, that came out of it. One was a really cool data set that I hadn't really thought about, which was Landsat imagery. So when we were looking at the kelp data, because we actually had kelp information being collected as part of the three-year study, but that was done after the slide had already occurred. People were like, well, what was happening beforehand? The Landsat imagery, you could look at, because of some known relationships, the cover and the estimates of biomass for macrocystis in that area. So let me just orient you to the graph. So we're looking at mean biomass per, mix, per pixel. Okay, so they basically took the imagery and, and all the pixels were scored in terms of uh, their value of macrocystis and what the amount of biomass was. And then from 2004 up through 2013, south of the slide, and then from the same time interval, 04 to 13, north of the slide. So when I showed you that picture a lot earlier, and I, I kind of outlined that really big kelp bed to the north, that's that area that's sort of upstream of where that constant plume of turbidity is coming off, both before the slide and that plume that got even bigger with the slide. So it's not surprising that year in, year out, the uh, mean biomass in the, in the areas within one kilometer uh, ra uh, radius of ground zero is pretty dang high, except when you look at 2011, it's a little bit low. This is the slide year. But then 2012 and 13, it's actually back up to where it was before. Whereas if you look at south of the slide, you've got a lot of variability here. 2011, it dropped. But then 12 and 13 was still relatively low. We didn't see the sort of bounce back like we saw here, a big bounce back there. So we don't have causation, but it's certainly consistent with this idea that things like scour, turbidity and direct burial because of the sediment coming off the slide is impacting these kelp beds to the south. And from firsthand experience, because I dove on all of these to collect the information, there's the difference between diving in a kelp bed when you can actually see something versus diving in milk. And it's really, gets really old diving in milk after a while. Here's another just shot. I just want to highlight um, this upper graph. This takes all of those data by year and just says, let's, let's look at the average amount of um, biomass um, uh, across the years. This side here is north, so this is where we've got the nice kelp bed. And over those um, periods of years, so um, blue is 2004 to 2010, and then red is 11 to 14. And Pete just picked those. He's like, I don't know, we could pick all kinds of years, but I just kind of did sort of uh, you know, an interval before and an interval after. And I'd love to redo these analyses as we gather more information. Not much of a difference at all, and then clearly a difference in the kelp beds prior to the slide being much larger than before. As you move further and further away and you expand the area of coastline, which has more and more kelp and less and less influence of the potential turbidity plume, you see that this difference um, essentially diminishes between impact site, um, between before and after. So anyways, 
this is, some, this is the kind of information that we can use as a management agency when we're negotiating with Caltrans about are we going to let you put more material in there or not? Because for them, they would have argued prior to this, that's eh, no big deal. <clears throat> okay, the last section. So now we're going to talk about fish behavior, MPAs, and scuba. So this really gets far. This is like a Scott thing, right? This is not, I'm like going, oh my God. So Olivia, she contacted me back in 2013 and said, hey, I want to come down there because diving up in Bodega to do this work is going to be like a non-starter and I want to graduate and finish. So if I come down to Monterey, can you help me out? And I said, sure, we'll figure out getting some boats together and I'll help you out. And she was doing fish behavior. And I was like, eh, I'm not really interested in fish behavior, but I am interested in understanding how fish behavior might relate to the effectiveness of MPAs and those other things. So I'm like, okay, let's, let's go to it. And it's you know, an opportunity to go out and do some, some more work in the, in the sanctuary. So um, she has a whole bunch of sites all along the coast that are where she's doing what are called flight initiation distance surveys and old MPAs that were, you know, this is like Hopkins and Point Lobos. The new ones that were no-take MPAs, the, the State Marine Reserves that were established in 2007, and then some of them that are in partial takes. So she has different degrees of protection. And one of the other aspects she was interested in in the tropics, they show that areas with and without skin diver traffic, mostly not necessarily scuba diver traffic, the fish behave differently in those areas, particularly if you're removing fish for spearfishing. Not just that you're there observing them, but that you're a hunter. And so some of this work in the tropics was really compelling in terms of fish behavior and how it varies related to human sort of hunting uh, practices, but it hadn't really been done in temperate systems, certainly not in temperate MPAs. So this is an exciting aspect of, of her research. So let me just talk quickly about what flight initiation distance is. So a diver comes up, so what we would do, we'd have these little floats on weights, and we would, we would, we would kind of pick a fish that, as far as we knew, wasn't behaving towards us yet. How you know that? Well, uh, you know, if it's sitting on a rock and it hasn't moved and you saw it, okay, it's, it's not doing anything. So we would approach it, and at some point, the fish is like, okay, that's too close. I'm out of here, right? It's kind of standard thing. It says, I'm gone, swimming away, and she did these graphics. I think that's why I was like, oh, these are cool. Uh, I, I don't have the ability to do this stuff. You guys all can do this in your sleep, but... Uh, so anyway, I was like, oh, this is cool. So here's the flight initiation distance, the point, the distance at which the fish left. And so we would know that because we were coming closer, we knew where the fish was. And these are usually stationary or hovering. They weren't actively swimming. So we were only targeting relatively stationary animals. We would drop the float when they left. That's the position we were in when they left. And then we would quickly go and put a float and a weight where the fish had been, and then we would measure that distance. So that's how you get the distance. Um, and so she did that for 1,400 fish observations over the course of one summer. And um, I didn't see her. Alexa Rosendale was her, I think she's a grad student here, um, or was. Um, and she um, did all the diving with Olivia, which was crazy. I mean, I like to dive. They were diving all the time. Anyways. They were collecting information on all kinds of different fish species, you know, things that are more planktivorous versus piscivorous, benthic, um, sort of ones that are active, uh, you know, ambush predators, more active predators, et cetera. And one of the things she, she, one of the, it, she has a lot of information. I'm just going to show you some of the stuff that I found kind of more interesting as a non-fish guy was when you look at this sort of, this is sort of like a principal components analysis, this is a, a multifactorial uh, analysis where she's got these two dimensions that are explaining about 50% of the variation in terms of behavior relative to where on the reef, what kind of habitat they were utilizing. And so each one of these colors, each one of these um, ellipses represents a 95% confidence interval around the mean sort of behavior for a particular fish species. And so here we've got blue rock fish that are basically, they were for the larger individuals were up in the water column and would flee in the water column. You've got kelp and black rockfish here who <clears throat> would be kind of in the hovering or on the benthic, but actually would come back to their same site um, after you disturb them. Like sometimes you're even doing the measurements and then they would come back and kind of go, hey, what's going on? Why are you still here? You know, you're kind of in my zone. Um, then we'd have guys like the black and yellow rockfish that 
if there was a crevice habitat there, that's where they would go. Um, they would take off and hide into it or go even further back in the tunnel. We had uh, lings and, and uh, cabazon that basically would flee a little bit, um, uh, but they didn't really use any particular habitat. And then we had kelp greenlings, which were very flighty and would often leave and be gone. We would never see them again. The cool thing was she plotted this out, and then we sat there and looked at it and go, does this make sense in terms of what the fish do based on our experience? And fortunately, it did for the most part. So that was kind of cool when the data actually support your intuition. Or maybe it's, that's scary. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It might give you a false sense of confidence, but I was like, Hey, even I know what these fish do. I mean, I'm, again, not an ichthyologist, but I've been around them enough. They bump into my head and stuff. I know what they should be doing. And that's basically what they did. So one of the things that when she was looking at this flight initiation distance, basically, again, comparing these old MPAs, the new, the, sorry, old marine reserves, the new marine reserves, and then the partial take, these conservation areas, when you're looking at it, basically, there's no difference between the new MPAs in terms of the exhibit, uh, the flight response. <clears throat> and it was lower, the flight initiation distance was lower in these old ones. So when I sat there and when we got that information, I mean, we knew what was happening because you're in there and you're approaching and you're like, man, the fish in the MPAs, they let you get a lot closer. The flight initiation distance is smaller because you can approach them and then finally at some point they flee. Whereas out in the areas where they've been actively fished, up until 2007, you, it was much harder to get close to them. They basically took off. So that was an interesting thing in terms of, okay, is that because they're getting, they've been habituated to, in this case, people actively hunting them? Or is it in the case of some of these old marine reserves, they're habituated to divers being there? Because a place like Lobos and Hopkins has a lot of diver traffic. And so maybe those fish, they go, well, you know, you're not going to eat me, so I'm not worried about it. If you look at basically this response by all of these species, new versus old MPAs, and again, flight initiation distance, even by species, the pattern is very, very consistent. So what we were seeing in the previous slide was all species kind of lumped together. Here it's broken down by species. And basically, these animals, they're either, in a sense, bolder and allowing you to approach them more readily inside the MPAs, or they're habituated and you're sort of dismissed, it's unclear. Or all you have left in many, or not all, but the preponderance of fishes left in the areas that had been fished heavily for many years are individuals that are very skittish in a sense. And I'm kind of being anthropomorphic here, but it's the behavior in terms of what their response is. And this is a 20%, this is a big difference in terms of those in the new um, MPAs versus not. And then if you even look within species and look at this uh, relationship across body size, in almost all cases you have a positive slope in terms of the larger the fish, the greater the flight initiation distance. Which to me initially was, I was kind of counterintuitive. I thought, boy, if I was a big fish, why would I care if a diver's coming up versus a little fish? A little fish would seem like would be more prone to flee a site. And especially I'm thinking like cabazon and lingcod. I mean, they don't... I've, you know, all of you who are scuba divers have had that moment where you put your hand down and this thing squirms underneath it and it goes flying out. Because you didn't see the cab was on. You're virtually on top of it and it didn't move. But in this case, it could be that, in, 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 some, in some cases, it could be that some of these larger fish are actually um, more skittish because they're coming from areas where the big ones are the ones being removed. Now, a lot of what we've done is, it's kind of like, this is a pattern. We need actual experiments to kind of tease apart some of these mechanisms. But it's a very interesting pattern. So the last thing is the feeding trial design. So that was a lot of the information I gave you was mostly from 2014 and 2015. We went out with a lot, and some of you may have actually been involved with this, kayaks and boats and cinder blocks with line between them and squid hung on them and a camera that was set up, and a diver would come through and do a little disturbance and kind of keep the fish away for a little bit and then swim off into the sunset and come back an hour later. And in the meantime, what would happen to all the bait? And the fish would come in. And the whole time, the camera was recording what was going on with these bait lines. 
So this was a way to capture predation events um, without having to hope that a predation event, a naturally occurring one, occurs out. And the, the bait were all standardized to certain sizes. All of these methods were employed in a variety of sites, replicated through time, spatially. And she got a lot of really interesting results um, based on these. One of the most striking ones was, if you look at the number of bait consumed, so off of each one of these lines, there's basically 11 pieces of bait. And you look at what's the time until all the bait are gone. In the case of the old MPA versus the new MPA, just visually you see the bait in the old MPAs was gone very rapidly. And this red line shows how much it took uh, for 50% of the bait to be gone. And so a significant difference in terms of how long it took to get rid of this bait. In some cases, it's, it's, it wasn't a density issue. It wasn't necessarily a species composition issue. It was how big and how aggressive were some of the fish removing these squid bait from the lines. And you can watch the video. And she's got literally hundreds of hours of video that she went through to look at that stuff and score it. So when you look at the number of bait consumed per minute, and you just compare the old MPAs to the new MPAs, these old MPA fish, sometimes we, so we quickly realized you have to start the camera rolling right when we get down there in the old MPAs. Because as we're putting the squid out on these lines, the fish are coming in and hitting them. I mean, sometimes it was like, I didn't even get everything out and one of them's already gone. Versus the new MPAs, there'd be like no fish anywhere in the vicinity, and we put everything out, and we kind of be, oh, is anything going to happen? And sometimes we'd go, and then they would slowly come in, but if we came back, they'd take off versus in the, like at Hopkins and at Lobos, particularly areas with high scuba traffic, they're like, man, you're just the food train coming in, okay? The food truck has arrived, the window rolled up, and they're serving some uh, squid, some calamari. So looking at the behavioral studies, um, she's analyzing a lot of this stuff right now, but a couple of things that come out of it. When you're looking at flight initiation distance, there's a difference in behavior in the new MPAs. There's a 20% increase. In areas with high scuba traffic, there's a decrease in flight initiation distance. Um, and that's, we're not sure, again, if that's a, a habituation thing or not, or what's really driving that. Fish feeding, as I just talked about, is much more aggressive in the old MPAs. And again, same composition of fishes, and we're not talking about different fish species, we're talking about differences in behavior in these two areas. And then looking at habitat use and escape responses, there's some general patterns across MPA types, but the thing that, that to me was really an interesting implication that I never really thought about is that when you're, most of the time when we think about MPAs, we're thinking about production. How many individuals, how big are they, what's the biomass associated with it? Not all fish are created equal. Not even within a species are all fish created equal because we know size matters with fishes, not just in reproduction, but now looking at predation as a behavior. And what is your impact as a predator? Not just how many fish you consume, but what kinds of behaviors do you have that either promote or sort of um, prevent those, that feeding behavior itself. And that's something that I don't think is really appreciated sort of in general for um, sort of marine science to a certain extent. I think there's more information in, in river and lake systems and certainly on land with, with mammals and birds. But in marine systems, I think this is an aspect that um, uh, is going to be developed even more because behavior, and I wasn't thinking this before we started the study, but behavior has important implications for the effectiveness of the design, uh, or for, uh, sorry, the effectiveness of MPAs, and probably might become a consideration in future design um, in how you do things. And whether in a, in a partial take MPA, you change what size limits you remove from them, not just from a biomass perspective, but what is the impact of that fish in its behaviors in the system. OK, we're almost done. Almost ready for beer. I was very excited when I heard there was going to be beer. Um, so first of all, characterization of resources is an ongoing thing. This is an important aspect of the sanctuary and what we do. And although it's not a sexy topic for academics, um, it's, it's a necessary one for us. We're, we're really fortunate to have like Imbari just up the road that does a lot of stuff that they just go out and see what's there. I mean, they're doing experiments, certainly. But um, when we go out to Davidson Seamount with them, um, they're just as excited to see what's out there. 
um, some of the places they've never been to, and it's an eye-opening experience in almost every case. Monitoring clearly is used to inform management decisions, and it gets into documents. So I talked about the condition report. We're currently undergoing our management plan review, so we're updating our management plan, which is basically our, our guidelines for what we're going to be working on for the next five to ten years. And this kind of science helps us figure out where we have to allocate resources in terms of people time, in terms of um, boats that we have, other things, et cetera. And then experiments, obviously, like I, I've said, provide um, really important insight on the mechanisms that are driving the structure and function of these marine communities. And that's a critical role, and that's why it's not all just about monitoring. Monitoring is really important, but many of the mechanistic types of studies that you guys do here, that folks are doing at, at other academic institutions, really help us understand the why of certain trends or the status of certain things. So I can't leave without doing a plug, because I have to do that, because I'm a, a, an agent of the government. Um, so I'm going to plug a couple of resources. Hopefully many of you use these resources already. Our Sanctuary Integrated Monitoring Network website, the Simon website, has a lot of information that people use. We've got a lot of information on different habitats, projects that are taking place in those habitats, both for the Channel Islands, Cordell Bank, Greater Fairland Islands, and Monterey Bay. So it's not just the Monterey Sanctuary, but it's others as well. We have some information on kind of cool or crazy things that are happening. Um, and then the area where we get a lot of traffic is both at the projects, people, some of these are, are, are finished, they're historic projects, others are ongoing projects where people are doing either research, sort of mechanistic studies, or monitoring projects. Um, we have an online sort of field guide that we've developed, and we have a photo library, and those two components are also available on CPhoto, which is our free app that you can get. Now on the Android platform, too. It took us like three years to get it from uh, just iOS to Android, but it's available. And it's a really cool app that you can have on your, your phone or your um, tablet or whatever that you can use to help identify organisms, um, get some information, taxonomic information, as well as some ecological information um, and some pictures. So you can use that in the field. and. I encourage you to visit the Sanctuary website, sanctuarysimon.org, if you haven't already. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, th that, was, that was why the Landsat data were so important, because all of the diving data occurred after the fact. We have um, one of the sites, by chance, was one of the areas where we actually had some quantitative data from 2003 and 2004, that upper kelp bed. But um, it wasn't really enough. And we didn't have anything from either the ground zero or to the south. So this was, a, I thought, a, a cool way that remote sensing data could be used to answer a question that you know nobody was flying the satellite and doing any of that stuff to figure out the answer to that particular question. But it was a neat one, and it's one that we now is in our sort of booklet of tools that we're, we are hopefully going to use in the future to look at. Because there's going to be another landslide. Probably with this storm, we're going to have you know, my email be, if I check my email, I'll probably get, be getting a report about some closure on Highway 1 that may suck us into it or not, depending on how big it is. So that was a really cool um, use of remote sensing data. Yes? Um, I noticed in that data that Yeah, so, so that was one of, so the, I didn't analyze those data. So this was, you know, the, the Pete Ramondi, actually Pete and, and, and uh, Kyle Cavanaugh were doing th this work in particular. There were some issues with different, you know, different sets of images, different times of year. And I think they did a bunch of averaging to try and get that seasonal signal out to a certain extent. But that is definitely one of the, the possible issues. But 
when you see some, some of those dramatic differences, that was almost not a, a sampling error issue. That was the kelp bed was, was down. And, and that particular site, when we, when we went to that northern kelp bed very early on, back in 2003 and 4, that's a site that's called duck ponds. And we said, oh, let's survey at this kelp bed. But we were always worried because we could see right next to it, right where the slide was going to occur, you know, eight years later, there was all this really milky water. And depending on which way the winds were blowing, sometimes it got pushed up. And we would actually, we did, I remember very clear, it's, you know, not a lot of dives stand out in your life, but I remember one, this one because we were dropping down. And it was one of the few times I hit the bottom, but I didn't see the bottom. So it's kind of an unnerving thing when you're kind of descending and also, oh God, what did I hit? And it's like, oh, it's the bottom. And we said, let's forget it. It's just too murky, both because of kelp cover, but also murkiness in the water. So, you know, if we had imagery, like I wish we had aerial photography, like some of those images from Google on a monthly basis or a weekly basis to see what's happening with the near shore transport of that sediment. Because most of the time we see it, it looks like it's moving south. But I know it's got to move north sometimes. And if it does, how is it impacting that kelp bed? And then it would be really neat to see what the, ex, you know, what the sort of relationship is between days of sedimentation, murky water, at the right time of the season when the kelp's growing up, when it's small, and how shading can that really have an impact versus other times of the year where uh, the kelp's already there. It's, it's going to survive. The, the macrocystis. That's the other thing, too, about that site. When we, when we first dove it, we, so we dove the site within three days of the landslide happening. We got on the boat, we went down there, and a couple of us were like, so they kept saying, well, how close can we get to the slide? I'm like, I don't know. Let's just keep swimming until, you know, we get scared. And because we didn't really have a protocol. And they're like, well, rocks still come down every once in a while, but, you know, you shouldn't worry about that. And I'm thinking, yeah, we're, you know, so we jumped in the water and, and, and we started swimming and by about 25 foot depth, you couldn't see the hand, you couldn't see your hand in front of you. It was so milky and so much sediment in there. The areas outside of that, which for all the images we had ever looked at aerially, essentially had no kelp cover, no canopy cover, was covered with subcanopy kelp. So Caltrans thought it was sand. And they're like, we can just push it all in because it's just sand anyways. And then we went to the meeting and we showed them the video. And it's like, there are like eight guys whose faces just all went, oh. Because like there's fish, there's subcanopy kelp, the rocks are covered with invertebrates, there's stuff there, it's not just a big sand pile. Yes? So in relation to that, I just uh, was looking at a course we are looking at at Channel Islands on um, coastal monitoring of drones, right? They yeah. For an undergraduate class. And um, so how about uh, having weekly drone flights in areas that you're concerned about? I, I'm all for it. That it's, I, I think drones could give us all kinds of information um, related to that. As you probably know, drones and the FAA and we have no-fly zones in the sanctuary for planes. And we'll drone, we're actually in the pro process of figuring out the legal, from a research perspective, I'm like, let's fly those drones. Let's get them out there. I, I mean, I'll learn how to do it. But there are a lot of people like, no, 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 we're going to be disturbing, you know, mammal rookeries, bird. There's a lot of, so... As a tool, I think the potential is really cool, but we're going to have, we're proceeding, as the government does, very slowly. <laughs> yes? On the similar uh, train of thought, have you thought about something like an ROV system? Because you said the human ROV yeah. for the bio is that feasible? It's not, unfortunately, because of the kelp. So we're, we're, if, if it was other areas, it would be absolutely, the I think, the way to go. But for us, um, you know, you can't, you just, anything tethered is going to get tangled. It just, now if you had some sort of autonomous vehicle that, you know, a little torpedo that could kind of do something, I'm guessing like, by the, hopefully by the time, you know, knock on wood, by the time I retire, I will be replaced by that torpedo. But, but up until then, uh, I want to keep diving and doing it and seeing it for myself. But it's, it's um, the kelp is the problem. And the other thing too that you don't really get to do um, with any of the remote is, is take advantage of when you see something and doing course corrections. So as the person who's done all nearly 100 of those dives and, and let it, I, I, there's, there's a lot of consistency in there because of that. And, and even though my teammates change a little bit in terms of algae and fish, 
the where we're going, how we do it, what things we avoid or what things we go to, that consistency because I'm making decisions on the fly as we're going has, I think, helped the program and in, in reduce some of the variation that if you truly just did it randomly, you would get uh, more noise signal in there. All right, is it beer 30? <laughs> All right, thanks so much. I appreciate it.